to the third webinar of the Jack Gordon Institute's Women, Peace, and Security Forum. We are part of the Florida International University here in Miami, Florida. I am Dewey Turner, and it's a privilege to be hosting the series of webinars. Here at the Women, Peace, and Security Forum, we are truly a collaborative platform. We work with practitioners and academics to advance the Women, Peace, and Security framework together. We are really about sharing information and elevating one another. We want to create a very dynamic information hub that is accessible to everyone from the basic foundation to advanced knowledge. In our first webinar, which I invite you to, to go back and watch, we had a foundational episode with the basically the 101 of Women, Peace, and Security. Our second webinar, we had a wonderful guest, Deborah Bonello, and she was she talked to us about the realities of women in narco-trafficking and how we can look from a gender perspective, the, the issue of transnational crime. And today, uh, we are also still working on the series of foundational episodes. So we are talking about the Women, Peace and Security US strategy and national action plan. We want to provide an overview of the United States approach for the, the framework and also look at this context, maybe a little bit more widely with seeing what our partners are doing in security and defense. We'll be focusing on the historical developments, our current states, and a little bit about the future. For that, we are very, very honored to have three fantastic professionals respected in the field of women, peace, and security. I have today Lieutenant Colonel Erica Courtney, Dr. Karen Johnson, and Ms. Samantha Turner. Before we start, I'd like to briefly go back to the basics. And I would like to highlight that Women, Peace, and Security is an international framework that started in the year 2000 with the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which recognized the pivotal role of women in conflict prevention, resolution, and peace building. To date, uh, 107 countries have developed national action plans to integrate women, peace, and security principles. Here in the United States, we have enacted legislation, introduced a updated plan, and developed strategic frameworks across four government agencies that include the Department of State and the Department of Defense. The 2003 U.S. Strategy and National Action Plan for Women, Peace, and Security is a whole-of-government strategy for women, peace, and security implementation. It satisfies an EO also a WPS Act and also the WPS Act requirements. It asks departments such as the Department of Defense again and state to update their plans so that this new strategy can be fully integrated. Here's just a quick glimpse of what's in the strategy and I want to bring uh, your attention to the lines of efforts, LOEs. So for LOE one, participation, two, protection, three, relief response and recovery, four, integration and institutionalization, and five, partnerships. So again, I welcome all of you to take a look at the strategies in our show notes. And now it's my pleasure to welcome again our panelists. I would like to start with welcoming Erica Courtney. Lieutenant Erica Courtney is a trailblazing U.S. Army reservist, entrepreneur, and advocate. She has served in various roles, including military police, an aero scout helicopter pilot, and civil affairs officer. She is a NATO-trained gender advisor with many years of experience, also a dedicated advocate for women and veterans as an appointed commissioner for the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. She is an alumni of FIU, earning a executive MBA, Go Panthers. I encourage all of our viewers to see, to read her bio on our show notes. Lieutenant Colonel Erica Corney, welcome. The floor is yours. So I was asked to discuss WPS in the context of US, sort of where we are within DOD. I can speak broadly to other agencies and um, what efforts are being made to advance WPS and again, currently where we're at. Uh, I won't go too much into the global, Sam can speak to that, but this was born out of 
uh, what's called United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 in 2000, after the world paid attention to atrocities happening um, and how women did peaceful protests in Africa who came together and overthrew a dictator. So it got the world's attention that, hey, you know, look what can happen through the involvement of women. And it was the first time um, we were sort of recognized in that context. Seven years later, NATO came out and said, hey, we want NATO nations to come up with things called national action plans. How are you going to implement this gender lens into um, areas of your society? And then in 2011, the U.S. Uh, basically did its first, uh, the DOD national action plan. And then the DOD did another one in 2017. And then those honestly didn't go very far. It was uh, paper on pen wasn't doctrine. It was not, you know, um, what we call a instruction, a Department of Defense instruction. Um, so from that, I had the opportunity to uh, sit on the joint staff in the J-5. And they said, hey, WPS is going to be your portfolio. I had no idea what that was. Um, we had no training in our country, nobody to kind of answer my questions. So dug a lot into UN and NATO stuff and found that there was a course in Sweden taught by NATO, which was Women, Peace and Security. And I said, I need to go there. And um, it was fantastic. I learned more from our, uh, you know, my fellow classmates who had been doing this for 10 plus years in their own nations, which gave me a little bit of a heads up on how I was going to come back to the U.S. and the DOD and be ready for the questions that would come at a general officer level. Um, while I was there, Samantha Turner was actually an instructor at the NATO course. So um, she's been at this, you know, uh, for more than a day longer than I have. So that's kind of how, um, you know, I got involved. And then in 2018, I'll be darned, they said, hey, we need to create a strategy and implementation plan for DOD based on the National Security Council. And, um, you know, that comes from the White House. And they pushed it down and said, hey, U.S., we want four agencies to have equity in women, peace and security. So a state, USAID, Homeland Security and DOD was one. So me and a Navy um uh, one other Navy officer were handed this task to work with what's called the Office of Secretary of Defense to come up with a framework. We brought in all the people we knew who had experience, which wasn't many at the time, to kind of formulate what that was going to look like. Um, so years later, it finally was signed by the SecDef, um, and it made it as, you know, sort of our official um strategy and implementation plan, which was pretty broad on how DOD would, would push this out. And what really caused us to move in this direction was the 2017 Women, Peace and Security Act. It became law. We were the first nation in the world to have this as law. Therefore, it became funded. And that funding moved to these agencies and each combatant command, uh, theater level types of um, operations pushed it pushed it out to try to grow this program. So now we are in an iteration of, you know, OSD is working on the next iteration of a strategy for DOD um, that hopefully will account for more of the operational and implementation side of this program. Um, also, there is a draft Department of Defense instruction um, that is being worked on by OSD. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So we've been at this for quite a while um, in terms of challenges. So this is policy, this is paperwork, this is pen to paper, um, but we really could improve on the operational side of this. Um, you know, when you're dealing with Department of Homeland Security and USAID and state, um, you know, there are processes, but in the military, we're very unique because we need military people leading the efforts to really push this out into military planning cells and operations that are tactically focused um, because we simply can't have contractors do that. We need people to kind of integrate and say, hey, I've engaged with communities. I have determined that these are actually the problems 
um, that need to be solved. And then you work within the military construct and resources to, to fix that, you know, whatever the problem may be and work on that partner nation capacity building. Um, we, we have a long way to go there. Just a fraction of the funding actually makes it to any type of operational context. And if it does, it may be for a couple of days, maybe a week, um, you know, so we start, we need to start getting it out of the planning policy world and really turning this into an institutionalized military led program where we have civilians and the continuity oversight, but more people that really understand how to look at an operational environment and apply what we call a gender lens, um, ensuring the whole population is accounted for because women and um, children and usually, you know, disenfranchised men have something different to say than the guys with guns. Um, and from that, we can get really good information and then have better situational awareness and um, respond appropriately with the right resources instead of, you know, we usually go in and we think we know what we're doing, but unless we really take all of that into context, we usually, you know, end up offering solutions that aren't the right solution. So that's just, you know, human engagement 101. So I'm hoping that um, the more experienced gender advisors we get, uh, the more people will see this value. And that's really how this is going to grow. I get the opportunity now on the joint staff to sit in on global campaign plans, listen to the combatant commands, talk about, you know, the human domain issues that they face. Um, you know, I'm involved in all the real world operations when it comes to non-combatant evacuation operations or military assisted departures. And obviously there's human elements to that. Um, displaced people are happening all over the world, which leads to individually displaced camps. And there are unique needs of populations and this skill set to say, hey, we don't need a very large analytical tool. I can look around, I can engage and realize that something is not right. And I need to figure out what that is to reduce our liabilities and our risk to force. Um, so yes, we have some ways to go there. Um, you know, I will leave it at that and then let my, uh, my counterparts speak to their piece and uh, look forward to some dialogue towards the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Really insightful on how we have progressed some of the, the areas that we still have to work at. I, I love what you said about the commitment to make sure that we really have the right workforce employed to, to move this forward. And um, that's an area that we definitely can uh, continue pushing along with really normalizing this idea of the women, peace and security framework within defense and security. So I truly appreciate your, your input. So then we will move ahead and we will be welcoming our second panelist, Samantha Turner. She is a non-resident fellow at the Steenson Center, specializing in practical policies for future of warfare and human rights best practices with the NATO. With extensive experience in the U.S. Department of Defense and USAID, she has led groundbreaking initiatives on gender equality and inclusive leadership. Samantha served as a humanitarian advisor during the evacuation of Afghan, American, and Canadian citizens and co-led initiatives on the U.S. national strategy on gender equality and equity. So welcome, Sam. Um, so much experience, and I'm really looking forward to, to, to getting your insights. Thanks so much, Dewey. Um, I think that I think that we should maybe obviously say we're not related, but it's always lovely uh, working co-working co with another Turner. Um, so appreciate the invite and appreciate um, kind of the invitation to talk a little bit about um, the interagency approach, as well as kind of a bit of the global context as it relates to one piece and security with that security and defense lens that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I'll be building on a lot of what it is that Erica said in terms of kind of where we've been and where we're going. And I think the first thing um, that I would like to really point out to all the folks that are watching is, is that our national strategy is our national action plan. We're a bit unique. I mean, we're America, we do what we like. Um, so you know, that is our version of our commitment to 1325. And, you know, we had the initial national strategy, and then we had the 2023 national strategy, which I was involved in the very, very early stages of the drafting when I was um, with USAID as the senior advisor on gender uh, with them. 
Um, and so, you know, what I'll say and, and kind of contrast with, with kind of what Erica said about those initial uh, times was, you know, that's unique about this is the whole of, and it's not, it's not unique, but this is how the, the U.S. does business. We take a whole of government approach. And I think that it's very important that when we look at some of the efforts of gender equity and equality as they relate to um, defense and security, specifically with Defense Department as well as DHS, that we talk about what it is that the State Department is doing and what it is that USAID is doing. Um, I will very carefully say that I believe I'm one of the only people that has worked for each of these agencies, uh, the Defense Department, um, uh, USAID very specifically, and then I was attached to the Department of State uh, in my role um, during Operation Allies uh, Rescue and Operation Allies Welcome uh, forward in Ramstein. Um, and the way that other agencies approach this is in a lot of ways much more mature, it's much more integrated, and um, it's very interesting. And I think that that will speak to some of the frustration that we have from the defense side of the house in terms of implementation um, that I hope that we can maybe talk a little bit about when we talk about practical takeaways from today. So I think that it's very important to talk about how a lot of stuff that I experienced in USAID was very much institutionalized. What, er what Erica was saying, the, the direction that we need to go to, it was institutionalized. It was very much a part of their everyday um, project planning and execution. Um, they have gender experts throughout their entire enterprise that do this, um, and they do this well. And, um, and they use the different experts that they have within those functional areas in order to inform how USAID does things. Um, so that's a really important, and it was a very eye-opening experience for me. And then contrasting that with where DOD was, there's a huge difference. So I'm not saying that it's necessarily bad, right? Um, and, and I'll talk about in my recommendations of folks who are going to be working on this from a policy perspective or a practical defense application, how, we, how it is that we can basically modify how we do things in order to move more towards that. But I would like to open people's minds to the fact that in the DOD and the security sector, sometimes we don't look to the aid sector as an example of, of how we can inform what it is that we do. And I'm absolutely full-throatedly saying we absolutely should look to the aid sector and we should look to the Department of State. Um, they have the Global Women's Issues Office that, that does very specifically focus on a lot of things that are security and defense adjacent. And we have a lot of programs that we work on together. Um, and so I think that it's just really important, especially in the U.S. context, to talk about how um, we have examples of this being done really well in our own government right now. And that interagency coordination, that whole of government approach of the national security strategy that we have now, or the, the national strategy on gender equity and equality, excuse me, um, that that is something that we look very deliberately at, deliberately at as we try and grow and mature in the defense and the security sector. Now, globally, zooming out, um, I think that it's very important, and I think one of the bigger takeaways for the folks who would be watching this webinar um, that I would say is that the U.S. is kind of, you know, we're normally pretty good at a lot of the stuff that we do. We put a lot of budget, we put a lot of money, um, we put a lot of personnel and time into things. But especially in my experience being um, one of the first gender advisors in DOD and working in that enterprise as a COCOM gender advisor and advising our U.S. mill rep to NATO on how we should approach this, I think that it's really important that folks understand that the U.S. is a little bit late to the game in some of this stuff. And when we're working with our near peers, very specifically with our allies, you know, in NATO and other areas of the world, I think it's very important that we take a huge... Uh, slice a humble pie when we work with our allies and partners and that we kind of come hat in hand and that we that we ask and we are curious and we make sure that we um, respect that there's folks that have been doing this a lot longer than we have and they've learned a lot more. Now the U.S. of course I had a Swedish colleague one time say um, you know when when initiatives come out a lot of nations will launch a lot of dinghies or little rowboats out and they'll start paddling around and doing what they do and he said uh, very astutely, the United States tends to take time to build an aircraft carrier and then launch that aircraft carrier and go all in. And I think the exciting thing about where we are right now and the implementation of this is that the U.S. has launched that aircraft carrier. A couple of things that I wanted to pull out of the national strategy that I think are interesting and unique in this time around 
is that there is specific strategic planning and budgeting allocated. As Erica mentioned, a lot of this stuff has been codified into what we call the NDAA, which is how we fund the national defense uh, you know, apparatus writ large. Um, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on measurement and data, kind of utilizing data analytics, um, which, you know, there's a lot of um, interesting aspects to that. Uh, in some of my work in Stimson, I've collaborated with protection of civilians experts, civilian harm mitigation experts that are integrating AI into efforts on prote better protecting civilians. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And then also the emphasis on um, management and training. So how is it that we do this stuff? And you know, one thing that I will reemphasize that Erica said is it is very important in the defense and security sector that we have people like Dewey, myself, Erica, um, you know, because I, I myself am a reservist as well, still, um, that we have people who've been in uniform and who understand the eaches of being in uniform, being in the defense sector, and that we get better at that collaboration and consultation with folks in civil society, like Karen and other folks, um, to make sure that we are communicating with them what's going on based on our experience and based on what we've lived, right? Because civil society, that that kind of symbiotic relationship we have, they have a lot more of freedom, you know, and I and my Stimson, uh, and my Stimson role have a lot more freedom to communicate and talk about a lot of this stuff um, and to advocate uh, within and, and hear the feedback from folks who've been in uniform and say, okay, I think this is how we would like to contribute to policy. So I think that's a huge gap that the defense sector has not necessarily figured out is how to effectively collaborate with civil society, whereas in contrast, USAID is quite good at that. They're very good at consultation. NATO is quite good at that. They have a civil society advisory panel that explicitly comes in and helps advise at the political level on this stuff. So I think that's an opportunity for us moving forward. Um, I also think that it's an opportunity for the United States to kind of live its values and to make sure that we're um, to make sure that we're being very deliberate about what it is that we're doing, um, you know, as we implement. And I think also, you know, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't um, mention this here uh, in this particular forum, to be honest about where we're failing. Um, and I think that some of these things, especially from a policy perspective, um, we don't have a lot of control over. And, you know, I'm thinking about some of the policies and supporting folks that are executing and using funds in our name that um, they're perhaps not acting in a way that respects human rights. Um, you know, and there's unfortunately a lot of examples of that going on in the world right now. And so I, I feel like there's a there's an interesting dynamic that kind of happens when you work on this stuff full time. Um, it's very revealing and it's very sometimes very frustrating, um, you know, talking about how does this stuff manifest and then to uh, and then to then recognize that we, especially if you're uh, working on behalf of the U.S. or you're working with a think tank that's informing U.S. policy to understand that it's very, very important that we maintain that humbleness and that we maintain that preventative mindset and make our make it so that our policies are responsive uh, to those types of things and build out practical applications that help empower us to um, make sure that we are um, able to live our values very specifically in defense and security sector um, you know, kind of areas. And, and I'm happy to talk more about that when we get to the practical application standpoint, how we can exercise it, how we can socialize it um, within our own uh, within our own circle. So um, with that, I feel like I've, I've sort of touched on what it is that you wanted me to touch on, um, but looking forward to um, talking a little bit more and hearing what other colleagues have to say uh, to add to the conversation. So thanks very much. Thank you, Sam. This is very insightful. And I, I want to tell our viewers that the U.S. strategy and national action plan for women, peace, and security, we'll make sure that we add a link to our show notes. So if you're interested in reading it, um, a lot of information there. Thank you. I love what you said, Sam, about the, the humility part and how we have to really be humble and, and learn from our partners, learn interagency, as you mentioned, uh, from one of them. And I'm sure that USAID and State Department also have a lot to learn from, from DOD, exactly from a practical standpoint in many instances, um, since we are really, really good at contingencies and things of that nature. We really can exercise WPS. AI, how exciting. We talk about innovation. That is so important. And uh, I really think that this is that this actually should be a future conversation. 
on on AI and innovation in the forefront of uh, of of WPS. So thank you for for your contribution, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your your practical application. You know what you will comment with us. So thanks, Sam. Okay, for our next guest, I would like to welcome Dr. Karen Johnston. She is a seasoned policy analyst and project manager with extensive experience in international security, U.S. European relations, and gender peace and conflict analysis. She currently serves as the research director at Women International Security and is an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland College Park and American University. Again, to our viewers, full bio in the show notes. Welcome, Dr. Johnston. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. It's a pleasure being among um, such um, wonderful individuals who have a great deal to say and about a very important issue for our times. And and thank you for listening in. You know, to the viewers who will be be listening. Um, I just wanted to say real quick that Women in International Security is a non-governmental um, organization that promotes gender equality by advancing women as leaders in the international peace and security field. So my comments are not going to be necessarily sort of government related. They're a little bit broader. So my remit and the questions that I was, was asked to, to address were about the way ahead for WPS strategy from our perspective and from our work um, that we do at WISE. And so I'll provide a few introductory comments and then take up some of the issues at hand. Um, and we will soon be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the passing of uh, 1325 and 2000. So I think this is particularly an important discussion that we will have today on the future of WPS and how that fits into the broader context of the United States and its its work um, in this area. So the the front the you know my bluff so to say is it's my belief that women peace and security is one of the most effective mechanisms for advancing gender equality because it is a tool or approach that is very adaptable to today's emerging security challenges in a security environment that has moved from state security to human and inclusive security. And we still have, unfortunately, hard security issues, a, a conventional war in Ukraine, for example, nuclear weapons, but current security threats have expanded our definition of what security actually is. We have security threats that cross state borders, pandemics, trafficking, extremism, cyber crimes, and conflicts whose root causes and drivers are based in political, economic, social, cultural grievances, discriminations, and structural inequalities. So at a very human level in the human domain. So 1325 was adopted, again, as was, was not, uh, noted at a time after the Cold War when the global community was racked with civil wars and es escalating violence against civilians and particularly against women and girls. And so women's organizations, the critical, critical role that uh, civil society plays pushed hard for the international community to respond and 1325 was the result. So the context back then, I think has in some ways shaped mistaken views about WPS and that it is relevant only in certain kinds of conflict scenarios that it's a Western concept, it's housed in the UN. So that's somehow external to us. Um, for example, it is in foreign ministries in some Latin American countries that the responsibility for WPS resides, something external to our own sort of understandings and experiences. But WPS wasn't envisioned to be a rigid structure. It's not static. It is a set of, yes, aspirational principles that are adaptable to an individual country's needs and local conditions. So these two observations, one, that WPS is well suited to address current security scenarios and that it is a mechanism that countries can shape and adapt to their own security needs means I think that there is every reason to place confidence in the future of the WPS agenda over the next 25 years. So let me look at this from several other different vantage points. We know that there's a large body of evidence to show why gender matters and why WPS is thus critical to our own national security policy. And as we've heard, the US strategy and NAP identifies WPS agenda as a strategic priority for both US domestic and foreign policy and national security. And so the lines of effort that are stated are really important and, and mirror the WPS agenda and its principles of participation, 
protection, um, in partnerships, and again, in very important issues such as integration and institutionalization and relief, recovery, and response. So a key observation here, I think, is that gender integration and institutionalization contribute to the operational effectiveness of at the tactical, operational, and strategic level. So we, we know um, in this and have it documented, you know, access to groups in areas where male counterparts can't, adding situational awareness, gaining local trust, all of these various issues that have been documented. For example, we only have to think of the female engagement teams in Afghanistan, where it became clear that a diverse unit was a more efficient unit. And then we can look internally, try to sort of inside uh, where uh, my colleagues have done, you know, a great deal more in providing you and the viewers with much more sort of detail about these issues, um, the, the perspectives. So where women peace and security enhances U.S. national security and strategic planning. So the emphasis placed, I think, again, important on internal capacity building through this integration and institutionalization. institutionalization. So that's important to provide gender perspectives on all the issues across, across government. Um, and I was recently um, watched a presentation at RAND, which highlighted some of the work that DOD does to fulfill this line of effort. And I think it's important broadly for uh, the implementation of WPS. Um, so DOD, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, is building policy guidance on WPS that will result in a common set of information needed at the strategic, tactical, and operational levels, and to integrate WPS guidance into other policy guidance in a more better and a more strategic fashion. So, you know, related to security cooperation guidance, humanitarian assistance. And in all of this, um, communication, education, and training are key. Right? The goal is to integrate an individual with a WPS skill set that merges with their other skill sets to see, for example, um, intelligence through a gender lens. And uh, I think also importantly to note, and and um, which uh, which is, builds on some of the comments previously, the strategy requires Defense Department, State, DHS, and USA to develop their own implementation plans with specific objectives and timelines monitoring and evaluation, which is itself very important, again, for that whole of government um, approach, the necessary needs for that interagency process so that everyone involved um, understands what the strategic needs are, what the planning is all about. And I wanted to spend some time also looking at the external sort of elements of the WPS strategy. Um, WPS provides the US, again, with opportunities to advance these principles through partnerships, through security cooperation efforts with governments, multilateral organizations, community level stakeholders. Um, you know, our project, Women in International, International Security Project in 2020 and 2023 examined progress in the integration of gender equality and the WPS agenda in 28 countries in the US Southern Command and Mexico and identified several relevant points, I think that are relevant to our discussion here. The integration and implementation is a key variable. The rhetoric from different countries and from um, the, the countries we studied often doesn't fit the gap in action and transformational change. So there remains a disconnect between strategy and action. And this means that there must be strong political will and government commitment to follow through, to commit the resources, the personnel, the training, to change the policies and practices that give women an incentive to stay. And this, I think, was one of the insights that I felt strongest in this project. That is, if the mandate is to increase the number of women in your forces, then your recruitment policies, the work environment, the access to positions that build skills and paths to promotions, training opportunities, they have to be taken into account. And the military is exceptionally strong in education and training of technical skills. And it should be no different in a commitment to train the trainers, to train more gen ads and gender focal points, to set them institutionally close to the commander and to decision-making structures, right? And, and also to simply to train in gender awareness, sexual harassment and assault across all ranks and institutions. 
Um, I'm reminded of a remark I heard at a gender and security conference. Um, often military officers are given the task of handling the office's gender policy. Um, they generally have little formal training, at least in the past they have, and they often see gender as one more task to add to an already overwhelming list of responsibilities. And one more rock in the knapsack was the term that was given to me. So an, an, addit an, an additional and an unwelcome burden. But we need to change this view of WPS and gender equality mainstreaming to see it not as a burden, but as an asset and a natural component in building mission success because increasingly today's military is being tasked with more and more non-military missions. Disaster relief and response, humanitarian assistance, protection of civilians and conflict scenarios. You've heard some of the examples, especially with Sam. So the data show that women can bring diversity, skills, talent, experiences needed for a modern security force. So the WPS agenda can be successfully implemented into security institutions. And there are, of course, other examples of how WPS has been able to be implemented and, and shows you know, how flexible and responsive and strategic it can be. Um, for example, it's an invaluable tool for other US strategic approaches. And um, I was the Franklin Fellow in uh, the Conflict and Stabilization Operations Bureau in the State Department for a couple of years and um, had the opportunity to work both on the Stabilization Assistance Review and also the beginnings of the Global Fragility Act. And I think that's one of the examples. It, the, the GFA now and its strategy to redefine how the US prevents violence and advances stability in countries vulnerable to violence and conflict. The strategic imp implementation plans for the priority countries that were chosen focus on prevention, building partnerships, providing partner nations with tools to strengthen the community's capacities to manage responses to chronic violence and conflict. And WPS is an integral part of all of these strategic plans for these countries. Um, and if you're interested, WISE recently published a policy brief that looks at ways gender can be more deeply integrated into the Haitian strategic plan. So and the State Department also has funded its efforts to establish global centers, uh, gender centers of excellence to work with partner countries and support women's organizations in addressing gender equalities. And of course, we provide assistance to countries to support their women's organizations for women's ministries. And so you can see a broad range of tools and ways in which strategically and for our US own security policies that women, peace and security has to be and is an integral part. Um, Although again, right, implementation is the variable that, that we need to look at. So this brings me to the future of direction of, of the WPS agenda. What will the next 25 years look like for the WPS agenda? I think it's clear, it's integration and institutionalization. We need to change and turn strategy into action. The first 25 years have seen a growing awareness and commitment to closing the global gender gap. We've seen progress. 107 countries now have adopted national action plans, but we've seen setbacks. All the more reason, however, for implementing the kind of transformational change that is the next step in eliminating gender inequality across the globe. So in anticipation of the 25th anniversary of 1325 next year, we've, as a think tank and organization, um, research organization that bridges the gap between sort of policy and action between sort of the, the academic and the more policy related um, uh, communities. We are going to explore how the WPS agenda can be reinvigorated and adapted to current gender peace and security challenges to work for that transformational change to close the global gender gap so that it can be structured to meet the security challenges of the future. So the WPS agenda and the national action plans, again, were intended to be tailored to the needs of each country. It wasn't a standardized set of arrangements for all countries. And again, this is the key. It can be a mechanism for real change when it is a mechanism that speaks to the people themselves, to the physical, economic, political, emotional needs, desires, and aspirations of the population in question. So this is why the future direction of the WPS strategy, I think, is promising. It can be a mechanism to integrate ways of addressing the gendered impacts of climate change, for example. The integration of WPS and disaster and relief recovery units to respond to crises and disasters 
and provide equitable access to humanitarian assistance. And it can address gender and technology issues to provide protection for women across the technological spectrum. So it can be utilized to address a diverse set of conflict scenarios, not just one kind of scenario. And having security institutions that are trained in WPS and see a gender lens as a natural extension of their mission value will make a real difference. Because where there's more gender equality, there's less conflict. And that ultimately, I think, is our goal. Um, so I'll stop there and look forward to our continued discussion. Thank you so much, Karen. I, I, I love this, this the what the promise is, right? That having this document and institutionalized is so important. Uh, when I was in uniform, um, all is constantly, especially in, to, in, in talking to senior leaders, going back to the higher strategies, because you can definitely take points. They're very actionable and, and, and that are institutionalized. So they are coherent because no leader wants to just, you know, in the military or any, you know, in, in U.S. government, for sure, we don't just do things randomly. There's a direction. And, and that sort of gives us the North Star and, and it's adaptable. Uh, the agenda globally is adaptable. So it's important to, to look at the specific needs, as you mentioned. And I did not anticipate that I'm loving the direction that this is going with some, you know, how WPS and innovation, adaptability, you know, support for solving wicked problems now and in the future. I, I really think that is a very exciting conversation we ought to have as well. I do want to bring it back a little bit and, and just highlight again the, the five pillars that we have with the strategy, uh, participation, protection, relief, response and recovery, integration and institutionalization and partnerships. In particular partnerships, because we cannot do this alone. And in the area of recovery, and, 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 and this will definitely be a, one of our next two episodes will be on, on humanitarian assistance as a relief with NGOs, because the gender perspective in those settings, it's definitely of importance. And this is a skill, as you said, Karen. So thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts to all of you. We're going to transition now to really what I think is the juicy part, um, which is the question and answer. And I, the question I have for all three of you is drawing from your functional expertise and experience, if you could please provide some examples, some specific real world examples that demonstrate the successful implementation of women, peace and security as a framework. And this time I'm gonna start in the in like in, in a different order. So maybe if I could welcome Sam first to, to share with us. I know that you have a lot of experience on the ground and otherwise, so please welcome. Great, thank you. Um, so I think one example that I would like to share, and this is real world insofar as one of the best ways to get senior leaders and folks that are in organizations to understand um, the, the very quick turnaround and the value of women, peace and security as, as it relates to how you do it um, is in exercises. So from a, everybody knows from a security and defense perspective, we do a lot of exercises. And so the example that I'm gonna give is related to a US exercise that we did. I'm not to disclose exactly what exercise it was just so we don't get into any classified examples, but, Generally, what, what I would like to, to kind of highlight is this was an exercise that was focused on a near peer competitor um, that we were uh, fighting in this particular exercise. And um, what it was that I was trying to do was to take and specifically build out a gender responsive communication strategy for our IO and public affairs. So our information operations and our public affairs um, kind of arm during that exercise. And um, what we were trying to do was to identify gendered messaging that was coming out from enemies that was playing on um, gender disinformation. And, and, and basically this is a, by the way, this is a much broader concept than what, than what gender disinformation is being defined, for example, at CSW right now. Um, and I have a piece that's coming out on that soon, actually. So watch this space. Um, and, uh, you know, basically what we tried to do was um, build up the ability for us to craft very quickly gender responsive messaging. So um, one of the things that I've spoken publicly about is the how. Nobody knows how to do this. There's about 
there's a hand, a small handful of folks that have been in uniform that know how to do this uh, within the USDOD. And so I think when we talk about this stuff, it's very, very important. And three of them, by the way, are on this call, uh, you know, right now um, that have been in uniform and have been this and have done this stuff. Um, so I think that it's important to talk about the pre, the during, and the post, right? Very quickly. So before. I had to talk with my leadership about what the exercise was going to be like. I had to introduce and educate on the concepts of women, peace and security. I had to form um, a one pager front and back that I could give out to people that would help people who had awareness, but not expertise in doing some of these things themselves. Um, so I had to empower them to act without me being there. Um, which meant that I had to meet them where they were at from a communications perspective. So I had to do a lot of pre-work before we started the exercise. In the middle of the exercise, I had to be there to coach public affairs as well as our information operations folks to be responsive to what was going on in what we call the road to war, um, as well as our daily updates that we would get on the exercise. This was an integrated U.S. US led but multinational um, uh, uh, exercise that we did. Um, and in the middle of it, to identify really good examples of ways where we could message in a gendered way. That's who's the audience that we were talking to. Um, what is it that we're saying? How are we communicating? What is it that we want our effect to be? What is the feeling that we want people to have, right? So that's very info ops heavy. And to also receive the information we were hearing and then pull out the gendered aspects of it and try and understand why our enemy, our adversary in this case, was messaging in that particular way. Um, it worked out pretty well, frankly. Um, and I think the, the longer that we talk or the, or the more anybody hangs around me knows that I have a lot of examples of when we tried to do WPS and it really didn't work very well. Um, and I think I'm very honest about that with people um, where, or where we did stuff kind of halfway. At the end of it, at the end of this exercise, um, one of the reasons why I think of this as a success is we codified this into our AAR process and said, you know, hey, this is what we did. Here's the documents that we did it with. And here was the result. And we were able to actually show that when we were fighting in the exercise, that this very specific gender responsive communication strategy was moving the needle in terms of uh, sentiment measuring, um, as well as, uh, you know, some of the other effects that we were kind of trying to create um, and then the particular operation that we were that we were in. So I know that that was very vague um, because of classification and stuff like that. But I think that that for me is an excellent example of, of how to do that in exercises. And when we're doing this as practitioners, what you want to do is you want to give the people that you're working with the experience of WPS working, if you can manage it, because you want them to have their own personal narrative of, oh yeah, I did this one time and here's what we did and here's how it worked. That's how you convert people. That's how you build within your own organization. Folks who are supportive of this stuff baseline when we're talking about how is it that we do this. And, and I will say again, that's something that as practitioners and professionals that do this, um, as well as policy advisors, need to work very closely with people who've done this stuff because we're the ones that know kind of, hey, here's how you move the needle. Here's how you take that 360 approach. Here's how you do the before, during, and after to codify the implementation. This is the how. This is the, this is the goodness in that. So that's an example that I have. So thanks for letting me share it. Up, oh, you're muted. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I am so happy that you shared this example. I'm about to cry uh, that I, that I because I have been talking about exercises when we are implementing WPS. It cannot be a separate thing. It has to be in the middle of it all with the tactical units, with cyber, with in, in, you know, in all domains, land, sea, ground, um, um, space, air. So for me, exercises is really where is an excellent example. Thank you for sharing that. And, it, and also because there's a, a process and because it's multinational. So now you're talking about touching 1,500, 2,000 people um, in this idea of gender perspectives and how to, no kidding, implement it. And, 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 and this is where we also connect with civil society. I, I, I will just here give a, a brief example as well with the exercise trade winds that United States Southern Command um, um, does. We brought in academics. We brought in uh, the Perry Center. Dr. Fabiana Pereira was one of our instructors. 
So it's really, it's, it's an all hands on deck, all hearts uh, in, in, in pushing forward. Exercises are for sure an excellent example of how we can operationalize the, 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 the framework and, and, the, and the plan. So thank you. Erica, how about you, another warfighter? Oh my gosh, so many examples. So, you know, we talk about women, peace and security and gender advisors, and we have these fancy titles. Nobody at any levels I've been able to do this work in cares about titles. They care about the results. So it's really important that just because you're a woman doesn't mean you're, uh, you know, somehow qualified to do this work. It's very strategic. You really have to understand how the military, you know, works and is structured. So if, if I can just go from when I got thrown into this on the joint staff back in 2017, yes, we were working on policy, but towards the end of my stint, COVID kicked off. So I got thrown into the COVID response cell in the Pentagon. And you remember how that was when things were kicking off. Well, this was one of my first examples of, hey, is anybody thinking about the women here and what that means in society? And, you know, I got looked at like I had three eyeballs. But as we walked through the response, because this isn't just war, you know, this is conflict, this is crisis, this is all of the continuums of recovery and peacekeeping, all of it. So anyway, I felt like, wow, okay. You know, I was able to shape our response efforts with women, children, and, you know, disenfranchised communities in a way that nobody else in the medical community, the ops community was thinking about. Then I ended up going to a division level where we had seven states and oh, lo and behold, I was in charge of everything, COVID in response, you know, training and policy and implementation. Um, so again, I was able to bring this lens to response efforts and work with the state's response agencies to ensure that women were not forgotten in this process as they have unique needs, right? Our, our country, everywhere else. From there, then I ended up um, augmenting joint staff in Korea, speaking about exercises. And I was watching the exercise on how we would respond if North Korea attacked South Korea. Um, you know, and I'm like, that's great, but are all your tanks going to make it up there if there's 24 million people crowding the roads? I mean, just basic thinking. They're like, what? I'm like, is anybody thinking about non-combatant evacuations, what that means, when people are going to be held, how they're going to be held, what implication is that to the whole population? What? Then I was invited to teach the whole staff and Eighth Army and the rest of them in Korea. And I'm like, wow, this is I'm not a genius, but everything I do and I've been thrown in, I have this gender lens to planning and operations. From there, I um, went to civil affairs. We were doing missions in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, you know, I've got plenty of examples and I was part of the refugees coming back from Afghanistan, a million examples there. But just simply going out with a civil affairs team into the community and engaging and doing it in a way that my coworkers, you know, had no idea why I was asking questions, why I was approaching, you know, people in the community a certain way. And so I started talking to the women in the community um, and they were very upset about something. And I'm trying to figure out what are these women upset about? And they were very upset because the Chinese own all the nail salons in the Philippines. And that was an economic kind of blow to them and they were kind of, you know, ticked off. They used to own the nail salons. And as a gen ad, I'm like, Ooh, let's pull the thread there. And my, you know, coworkers are like, what, you know, what, what's okay. Big deal. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, why, why does that matter in the context of national security that the Chinese are coming and taking over all the nail salons? Anybody who's a woman on this panel and outside knows that we talk when we're getting our nails done. That's a great place to get information. You know, this is the information campaigns and 
pulling information um, because we all know the Indo-PECOM region is uh, very contested at the moment. So that is an example. I got the opportunity to work on OAW. I was brought in by a general that knew me and she's like, I don't know, what are you, some weird gen ed thing? All I know is I need your eyes. I'm missing something. I'm missing something. I need you to kind of tell me what I'm missing and solve some problems that I don't see that the staff is not attacking. So I was able to form a, a team of 20 and um, we recognized very clearly that the way information was being pushed to the community of 13,500 refugees was very centered towards men. It was all on the phones. The women didn't have the phones. Most of them couldn't read. So we recognized we had to engage with the female population. And from those engagements, you know, we didn't just throw women out there. We trained them for, you know, two weeks on how to engage what kind of questions to ask, how can we best serve them? And we found medical liabilities, contractual liabilities. I mean, we found a lot of stuff, a tactical level example of bringing women together to solve problems was as we had COVID, we had STDs, we had rabies. I mean, you name it, we had scabies, we had everything going on around there. But E. coli was one that was floating around and the, you know, interagencies, public health, we were doing hand, you know, we were doing a bunch of stuff. And this is where Women, Peace and Security comes in. Everybody thinks they have an idea of why E. coli is going on. So, you know, we tested the food, wasted a bunch of money, you know, took time, wasn't the food. Well, people aren't good at sanitation. They did the hand washing classes all throughout the whole 13,000 people. And they did a few other things. And uh, I said, look, I'm gonna show you how this works. I got together about 20 women, um, Afghanistan women, and I put interpreters around the room and they sat in a very traditional way, having tea, just conversations. And I said, I want you all to hear, listen for things that we're trying to get to this, you know, solve um, the riddle on why E. coli is. One interpreter heard something about, it's so busy in the morning in the bathrooms. Another interpreter, heard something like, yeah, it's so crowded and, you know, we're having cleaning issues. Another interpreter heard something about, gosh, you know, we're having a hard time taking care of the babies. I mean, there's babies being born there every day. Um, anyway, then I got an interpreter saying something about, it's so busy in the bathrooms, they're having a hard time uh, getting access to water. And I was like, whoa, I want to pull the needle on that. So turns out getting together all of the interpreters and women, peace and security at its best and this gender lenser is putting together puzzle pieces to answer a question. Turns out that women in the morning were so busy and water in Afghanistan is pretty murky and they were literally taking their baby bottles and scooping them in the toilet and putting formula in the baby bottles and feeding it to the babies which then spread throughout you know, the entire um, encampment. Would my coworkers have been able to figure that out? Absolutely not. I got a million examples like that. As smart as we think we are, it's about engaging the right population, getting to the why and providing those right solutions. Um, now again, I'm joint staff and I get opportunity to review doctrine and joint pubs and you know all of these things that deal with information or you name it. And I'm embedded in real world, world ops, just saying, are we paying attention to, and I'm able to write paragraphs that address these kinds of things that we should be looking at. So I've had the privilege and the opportunity to kind of work at all of these different levels and not call it a thing. I'm just doing my job, but through both eyes open. And that's where our partner nations are crushing us. This is how they do their job to the lowest level. This is military training, military, seeing this in action, showing that value. Um, you know, again, we can make this all formalized all day long, but until we get people like us that are embedded and just making people aware of things that they're missing in those blind spots, you know, that's the power of what we're doing. But again, it has to get operationalized and implemented. And a gen ed is not a gen ed just because you went through a course and you've never done anything with it. You got to look to those that have been around so we can mentor them and, you know, guide them and, and be much more effective to their commander. So that peripheral is being looked at in the planning instead of the obvious, um, because the peripheral is where things are happening that's funding the bad guys, right? So. Anyway, I can go on and on all day long, but 
Um, you know, I'm just privileged enough to be in positions uh, to be able to, to do this work without calling it anything. That, that is amazing. There's a lot of power in practice, that's for sure. And this example of, of you know, the unfortunate example of the water bottles, but it, it has, it sheds a lot of light on, it's a wicked problem with a simple solution, is in the human domain. And, and, and it doesn't matter how many machines we have. I mean, strategic competition, I say, women, peace and security gives us a strategic edge. Talk about, you know, our competitors, China, Russia, Iran, you name it. 50% of the population are women. We better get, start listening because there's a lot of solutions, a lot of information when we start dealing and really observing. And you don't have to be a woman to have this skill, as Karen said, this is a skill, Erica, you said that too, this is a skill that we can learn. And that's why training is so important. Education is so important. And I love that we have Karen, Dr. Johnston. Uh, she is an academic. So how about from your perspective, some practical examples uh, for the implementation of WPS? First, I want just to make a very short comment, both for Eric and, and Sam, that is, this is so, so important. I think that um, sort of in some of the, the, the literature that I was reading recently, there was this point made, which is, which is why it's so important to talk about these things, is that we went from sort of gender as a kind of need, right, so to, to, for someone to begin to pay attention to it, to a benefit where, you know, in this context, we're talking about operational effectiveness, but we still, right, have to reach that point just where Erica is already. That is, this is, a, this is a natural sort of automatic sense of understanding the, you know, the completeness, right? So there should not be that sort of, is this really something like, is, is this WPS or, you know, is this something where we have to think about gender, right? The, the jump towards something that is a natural component is the next step. And I think, you know, obviously a lot of women are there already. <laughs> and we just have to bring everybody else along. So anyway, I just wanted to say that it was really exceptional. So those those examples. And for me, you know, I, um, our experience at WISE uh, is working also in sort of security cooperation. And there were some real sort of, um, sort of, uh, impacts that that we could see and one of them again I mentioned that we worked on this um, Southcom project where we um, looked at 28 different countries um, in Latin America and the Caribbean on looking at the integration of gender in their military and national and national police forces and we we developed an assessment tool 51 indicators that closely aligned with WPS principles the WPS agenda and, and applied them and tried to begin to develop that baseline data. So for us, the most important thing is also like, in order to make those decisions and, and in the rooms, the data has to be there. And that's one of the most important and one of the most frustrating aspects of working in the you know, gender peace and security field is that we need data, we need more data. And so one of the um, impacts so and one of the trainings that I participated in, in in Bogota on WPS was from a, a woman, the, the first, uh, I think she was a colonel, the first combat pilot for Peru. And she said to me that in fact, the, the quantitative and qualitative reports that were done for each of these individual countries. So each country had two, two reports, um, methodological reports that the um the well that's i don't know what it's, the ranking right or at least the perception on, on the part of the peruvian government that it wasn't doing as well as it should be doing was an impetus for them to actually begin to adopt the national action plan which they did so having the data having sort of the um you know something that can show them how to do it. And then again, right, the monitoring and evaluation, the sense of having a longer term capacity to understand how you make decisions, where do you put the resources, how do you adapt, are really very critical. And so, but there, you know, the women mentioned that they saw these reports on the tables when they went into meetings sort of uh, throughout the region. So there, there can be an impact and there can be a real effect on it. And the other example I actually have is when we were asked by AFRICOM to assist them with a request. Um, there is a, an African military law forum that meets annually, and there are women military um, lawyers 
as members of this forum, and they wanted to develop their own network within the forum, but didn't know how to do it, approached the legal counsel in AFRICOM and said, we want to bring the gender aspects right, into this forum for everyone, not just sort of having the, the network as a little sort of addendum on the side, but actually integrate it finally when it's established and set up to do that. And, and so we were able to find a really remarkable woman um, who was able to go to, um, to Africa and actually begin to build and create the structure for these um, African women to actually have their own network and then to integrate it so that at the regular sort of annual meetings that these women had a voice in those proceedings. And so again, right, sort of having just simply responding to the needs and being able to find, which they're there, right? These competent and exceptional women are there. We just have to be able to put the two together. Thank you so much. And, and there we go again with the power of practice and the power of knowledge. And, and I must say the, the reports the, from WISE on, on the Western Hemisphere and those countries, it's really was filled a gap. There was a wide gap of no knowledge and we we're trying to solve problems with no knowledge is really not the best way to do. You must understand the operational environment and WISE came and filled that gap. And now we have resources that we understand better. And I hope that there's continuity to it, that they're revised and, and data, you know, over time. So we can really see, are we doing better? Are we not? How are our partners doing? So thank you. Knowledge is definitely power. This is very exciting. Uh, I could talk for a long, long time. We're approaching an hour, but I still want to ask one more question. Uh, and, and this is, is based on your analysis of, of the current strategy. And once again, for our viewers, the link will be on the notes. I highly encourage you to take a look, uh, to glance at it and get more familiar. Again, knowledge is power, uh, to be able to familiarize yourself with the language so we can execute and, and, and really put into the world. But based on your current analysis of the, the strategy and with the focus on collaboration, which is the hallmark of the Women, Peace and Security Forum, we really want to be the hub for, collabor for collaboration. So with this idea of the new strategy and the collaboration, what are three takeaways, three takeaways that we can have to inform future efforts to enhance the effectiveness of the Women, Peace and Security Framework? So I'm going to start with Karen, is that okay? Yeah, the three takeaways. I, I think that for us, um, our work on building networks um, and across, you know, across, um, you know, a multiplicity of, of themes and topics is really critical, at least for me as the research director. Um, what we need is, for example, when we look at climate change, these complex sort of wicked problems, you know, everything has a gender dimension, but climate change has the conflict dimension, it has a migration dimension, it has the gender dimension. We have to begin to try to understand how we can address those um, through our networks and through um, working together with individuals. And so, you know, as, as we did, um, you know, um, Dewey in New York at CSW 68, to be able to share the, you know, the knowledge base for individuals who want to know, for example, we worked with the UK Ministry of Defense uh, on discussing the advancing gender equality through the implementation of gender perspectives in military institutions, which is some of the work that, that we've done. And it was, you know, sort of military advisors from very different countries. And the, the sharing that, building those networks is, is really critical for understanding how, you know, how we can move forward. Um, we build networks with our international affiliates. We have um, interesting women, in, you know, and wise in Poland, in India, in Mexico, and building those networks, not so that they sort of come through here, but also building them across each other. So that maybe wise, you know, Germany can work with wise Mexico on, on these particular issues, particularly in the global South, where we don't have enough sort of representation, but we want to be able to build those networks. Um, and um, I think also, again, my work in uh, the State Department was a, was a big um, 
I think it was for for me, it was essential for understanding again the sense that WPS has the capacity to be to to build and react to the kind of security challenges that we have. And that is building through those issue areas, those complex problems. Because again, you know, every part of our these security threats and security challenges are gendered. We need to be able to work through them and connect them in really important ways. And so um, the Gender Fragility Act, I think was, again, in my experience, one of the more sort of ways in which we can build out um, to, for our strategic interests, right, to build a different way of approaching fragility and fragile states and stabilization issues. And so I think, again, advancing all of our knowledge bases through these institutions, through networks, through these discussions, and again, through sort of the think tanks, the civil society, the military and security institutions. There, you know, again, Sam, the critical issue that she brought up again and again, right, is this sense of, in, you know, broad, breaching all of the silos, because we can't get to those solutions until we breach those silos. And one of the most important things, again, is that the gender dimensions that they become a natural component of how we understand the solutions. So um, very, very important. Thank you so much. Erica? Yeah, you know, from a military context, uh, again, I'm gonna go back. I'm a big believer in legislation and policy if written right, it could influence things, you know, in the millions, you know, um, in a good way. But the reality is a lot of our military leaders don't have time to sift through the millions of policy documents and doctrine and all the things that are out there. There's this really interesting sweet spot that we need to take advantage of. And that is right before an emergency in which we have to react to, whether it's a natural disaster, you know, some type of conflict crisis, and if we can get in and make sure that someone who is running this pre-movement planning, uh, which I, you know, I have done a couple of times and say, hey, I need an hour and a half on the floor to teach each Jace, you know, to each to teach each staff member how to look at their job just a little bit differently when they're doing this operation, or teach the soldiers that are going to be out there in these communities how to see things through this gender lens. You may only get an hour, an hour and a half if you're lucky, but that plants the seed and sometimes that's the best we can do. In terms of growing this, we've been at this for over a decade. And honestly, some of these combatant commands are only teaching gender advisors maybe two classes a year. We're never gonna scale ever this way. Um, and for it to be truly effective, no offense to contractors, but this has to become a train the trainer for it to have scalability. And there has to be a baseline um, that all combatant commands, all services, all staff has, because I want to look to the Navy and say, they're a gender advisor and the Air Force has a gender advisor and the Army has a gender advisor. I need to know that we're all on the same framework. You know, we have that base and then there's room for each of those components to make it whatever it is that is applicable to their service or their space. Um, we're not there yet. We have a ways to go. And honestly, you know, working in, uh, you know, the personnel right now, we can talk all day about this, but until we work within the infrastructure of military systems and processes, personnel, for example, it is a five-year process. A service right now would have to tell somebody at a combatant command that I have a need for something called a gender advisor. That goes up and that goes through a manpower study. This takes years. They come back and say, yes, we validate that this is a capability that is needed for the force in three, four years. Once that happens, it takes another couple of years. If we started right now, this will not even be a codified position in the military for five years. So again, we can keep focusing on bigger picture theory, but until we work within the confines of military systems, this will not grow in a way that needs to grow. Train the trainer, 
military systems, being able to react and respond when the operators ask the personnel people, I need this capability. Right now, we're, we're not tracking what a gender advisor is. Nobody knows what that is. An, an operations guy has no idea that he might even need a gen ad for an international mission. So we've been at this again for a decade. We need to stop with, you know, a, a lot of, you know, the, the bigger picture, we should be well beyond that. Um, and, and, you know, that's, I'm just being honest, we, we can be further along. And the way to do that is again, to make sure that the military is involved in the process. Thank you, Erica and Sam, I'm going to give you the final words. I'm, I'm honored. Um, so to, to build off of what Erica was just saying, you know, the recognition that, especially in the security and defense sectors, that there is so much and so much nuance of being someone, especially a woman or a man in this case, who's raised their right hand and sworn oath. Nobody can ever take that away from you as a practitioner. This work is inherently governmental. This work is inherently military. It is very, very important. And I think if I were to summarize what Erica was saying is that we have military people doing the policy development, doing the understanding and professionalizing our workforce by setting standards, um, whether that is the, the, uh, um, the services setting the standards or whatever, which brings me to my first takeaway is nothing about us without us. There needs to be military people involved in every single conversation on women, peace, and security. The word security is in there. People who have put that uniform on, who have women who have been in those rooms where they're the only one, police persons, uh, uh, customs people um, who, have, uh, who are women who have been the only ones in the room need to be in those rooms. We deserve a voice. We are the ones that have put ourselves on the line and we need to be involved in every single conversation when we're talking about women, peace and security implementation because we can be the ones that can be that sounding board for folks who can advocate for us like civil society where we can say, I know that this is the recommendation you want to make. Let's walk the dog on how that's gonna play out from a policy perspective, right? Because everybody thought, for example, that it was a good idea that we did the CST missions, which was pulled from all army. Then civil affairs took all of the CST missions. Those are kind of the FETs that were um, the female engagement teams, try not to speak in alp alphabet soup, that were assigned to Ranger Reg and ODA. And civil affairs said, oh, okay, we're going to have everybody in civil affairs on active duty, which is a very small percent. It's 20% of the army's capability doing it. There's only a certain percentage of women in civil affairs on active duty. So they put that entire burden of the CST program on the women in, in civil affairs, many of whom did not necessarily want to have that be their full-time job. So there was an unnecessary push and pull in that policy as, as a result. So that's the first thing, especially if you're going to be someone who's going to be in that think tank world, someone who's going to be doing policy. If you have never been in the military, or if you don't know what it is, or you have never done this on the ground like we have, you need to bring folks like us into the room to have that dialogue with us, right? We need to establish that professionalism. There are not a lot of people who have done this yet. That's okay. We're building the bench in real time, but give us a call. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and, and, and I think that Karen and Erica both pulled from this as well as by remarks, is influence what you can. Take the knowledge that you have, take where you're at, and do that real-time education to influence what it is that you can, to ask those questions, to be curious, and to be able to have the knowledge to back that up and explain to people, because anything that, let's be real, that is viewed as other or anything in a hard security setting that is viewed as women-centered is not something that a lot of people are comfortable with. And so if you don't have the skills to understand and to explain one piece of security in a hard security context, you, again, need to call people like us to be like, hey, how could I do that, right? So that's another thing. It, it's influence what you can do the things that you can, and then share that knowledge. I think we need, I think we need to build better platforms to share that knowledge. And then the third thing is, is that change takes time, right? We've talked a lot about, you know, how good state department is in this stuff. And, and I've talked about the influence of, of, you know, coming into USAID and be like, oh my gosh, people are asking for my help. I don't have to convince or sell them on this stuff. Um, that change takes time. 
and then to recognize the global context that we are in right now with gender disinformation, culture wars, a global backlash against women's rights, and frankly, feminism, right? Um, which we haven't used the F word yet in this, uh, in, this particular, uh, um, in this particular forum. But the thing is, is that, you know, understanding that that is the context that we are operating in makes it very, very important that you know your stuff, not only from a WPS standpoint, but from the context you're operating in, whether it's security, DHS, you're working in customs and border protection, whatever. You need to be able to come and meet people where they're at in order to uh, in order to have those conversations and learn from our partners and allies who've done this work. Learn from what it is that they're saying. Read the reports that Wise is writing, that Rand is writing, that Stimson puts out. Read that stuff because those are the people that are that are doing the research in order to empower us to do our job as practitioners. So those would be my three takeaways, but I completely concur, um, you know, with what my colleagues here have said, and um, this has been really fun. So thanks very much, Dewey. Thank you. It just kept getting better and better and better. And I keep going, but I have a timer, right? My military experience is still military precision. So unfortunately we have to, to come to a close, but I, you know, I'm just going to, uh, use your words and say yes information sharing and that's why we're doing these webinars so we can bring different perspectives we can bring different knowledges different functions experiences and and really put it out into the world and and see what resonates with people what is sound for our strategy for our government for our academics and um, and really create this network thank you for sharing that uh, karen networks are very very important collaboration and again the hallmark of the wps forum uh, here at the Jack Gordon Institute is collaboration. We're not doing this alone. This is not, you know, this is our piece of the pie. We really want to make this wide uh, knowledge so that we can have the new generation um, putting into, into action in the more experienced uh, generation really sharing what we know. So truly appreciate that. To our viewers, I want to encourage you to engage our resources on our webpage. There's a lot of information there from, from, documents to videos podcasts participate in our future webinars and, and join the conversation on social media we have a hashtag fiuwps stay tuned check out our, our show notes for information about our wonderful panelists and also uh, the link for the for the u.s strategy and national action plan for wps let's stay connected and support one another i want to thank all of you Thanks, Sui.